Penguin Bay is going to jump in three clear. Penguin Bay lands ahead of Judy and jumps in second time is done third. Jim Thorpe finishing well in fourth, racing up towards the line. And Penguin Bay is going to win the 29th running of the Magnuson Gold Cup. Penguin Bay. I'm very good, thank you. Far away. Okay, so I want to start at the beginning, if that's okay. So I'd love to know how you got into being a jockey. So I know your father was obviously a jockey too, and he won the Grand National when you were small, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. My grandfather was a road as well, so, um, and he trained for a while, and my father got into it. I mean, we're from uh, a rural background, and therefore, you know, kids in the not always, but kids in the town play football. Yeah. We rode horses, and um, I never wanted to do anything else. Yes, you mentioned he won the Grand National, and that was a huge influence on me. Yeah, I wanted to, to follow in his footsteps, and I wasn't particularly good at school either, so it, it <laughs> narrowed the choices. Yeah. So whereabouts are you from? Herefordshire. Oh, OK. But did you live in Gloucestershire? Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm still in the world I was. Why, is that your part of the world? Well, yes. My fam well, I grew up in Swindon, but my family now live Siren Sester Way. Yeah, yeah, well, I know that very well, yeah. No, yeah, so would you say that your father was a big inspiration then for Oh, yeah, career? definitely. I mean, he's still, it's funny, he passed away four or five years ago. He's still a huge inspiration. My children do, he's, to, to all of us, we still quote his sayings and, uh, you know, look up to the, um, to, to what the, his achievements and, and the legacy he left us, you know. Yeah, and you worked for Martin Pipe, didn't you? I wrote for Martin Pipe, which was a little bit like playing been centre forward and playing for Liverpool, you know, you, you, they kept, he kept passing me the good horses and uh, I was able to ride them, yeah, and that was an immense privilege to, to do it, you know, if you're a Liverpool footballer, you're a great centre forward for Liverpool, the winger keeps passing it over and you keep heading the ball and nobody said you're fantastic, it's a bit like, as I say, riding for Martin Pipe, that, uh, you know, he, you know, we were, we, we did work out as a great team, yeah, so, we were very lucky, but he was, he was an outstanding trainer, yeah. Was that the first place you went to in the beginning of your career? No, no, I was with a man called David Nicholson, who uh, uh, Richard and Woody was with, and a lot of other very good jockeys went through him. His, his father, Frenchie Nicholson, had produced some of the great best flat race jockeys of all time, in Pat Edry, Walter Swimburne, Tony Murray, and then the Duke, as we knew him, he had a similar sort of academy and an apprenticeship that produced flat race uh, jump jockeys as opposed to flat race jockeys, and I went through that. And I, I think it's rather sad that um, those academies don't exist anymore. I think that uh, we learned a discipline and uh, a way about racing that perhaps is missed now. So when you start off, you know, as a, a stable jockey, how do you get into racing competitively? Do you end up just, like you said, get given a really good horse and then they push you forward to ride competitively? Yeah, I mean, you get you get your breaks, don't you? If that's the right terminology in horse racing, you... Uh, you get a ride somewhere and and it runs well or it wins and you get a set you've got a seven pound claim behind you and then um, uh, you take your chance. I mean, with me, I was with David Nicholson and um, the senior jockeys. Things weren't working out for them, or one of them gets got hurt, and then there's a momentum behind you. The media is very important. There's a okay. media momentum behind me. Um, I was asked to go and ride for other stables and he, he said well you know I said if I don't become first jockey for you I'll go somewhere else and uh, then, then I became his first jockey yeah. so does that mean if you're first jockey does that mean you're essentially the best jockey on the yard well you'd like to think best but I mean basically you're you have the choice of the rides in the oh. yard or, or something like that yes yeah you have a contract to to to, to ride the, the horses in the yard yeah Okay, so then if you're starting off, do you get assigned horses that they think that you'd be best riding? Yes, you sort of. I and mean, then it's changed much more so now that you have, uh, you look at the flat, the, uh, the contracts are like William Buick has the contract to ride for Godolphin, doesn't he? And then 
match, I think, Crowley rides for one another, for, for, for the Blue College, um, Mactoon, Mal Mactoon. Whereas in my day, you tended to have a contract to ride for the stables. So John Franken rode for Fred Winter, yeah. Fitzy rode for Nicky Henderson. Um, I had a contract originally in my career to ride for David Nicholson's horses. Okay, and so now jockeys tend to ride for different trainers? Different owners. Or different owners, rather okay. than, Yeah, so there isn't... So on jumping, for instance, uh, so I'm trying to think of the jockeys. Yes, I mean, there are stable jockeys, but, but more and more, the big owners um, have... Um, the big ones. So AP, for instance, he rode for JP McManus. He just rode all McManus' horses. He was stable jockey to, to, to uh, Martin Pipe. But now the um, the owners have become more powerful. When I was you know, Richard, I mean, the society is saying that in my day it was the, the, owner, the, the trainers that were the powerful bit, but now the owners are so wealthy. Um, and some of these horses, people are having. 200 horses you've yeah. got to have a look at um Gigginstown and these people immensely powerful mm. individuals that run whole stables um and they, they uh they they want a single jockey oh well, i always wanted that and another thing i've always wanted as well so you know when you're starting off do you choose whether you want to ride flat or jump, or is it something that the trainer would maybe say you're probably better on the flat? Or it is all to do with the weight. With um, I might have chosen to be a flat race jockey because their careers goes on a lot longer and uh, uh, they earn a lot more money than the jump jump jockeys. But uh, uh, my my weight, I could my body weight was about nine seven, which means with a saddle and the breeches and boots, I could ride around ten stone. Uh, whereas flat race jockeys, their body weight is around eight stone, oh, so I didn't know that. The, the, their weights are going, I think, like eight, high eight, high seven something to to ten stone. Where our weight is going from ten stone to to, to twelve stone. So oh. that uh, generally the flat race jockeys are smaller people than the the, mm. the, the flat race jockeys. Again, than the jump jockeys, but again it's changing because. Um, People are getting bigger now, aren't they? That there isn't the uh, it, one of the reasons that women are getting more chances to ride, especially on the flat, is that there isn't the men around. I'm not saying they're, they're better or worse, but it, mm. it was a very male-dominated sport. But uh, you know, the society is bigger than it, or people are bigger than they were than 20 years ago, and then, uh, as as the as the diet gets better, so um, mm. there's less and less small people around, small men around to ride at, at the low waist and the flat. So yeah. women are naturally lighter it's and more like... getting more opportunities. Oh, okay. Without sounding too sexist. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> so, how did you manage to keep your weight? Did you have any specific diets that you followed? Oh yes, we said my father rode, and he, he used to have, he used to eat an egg on top of a steak some evenings this is diet you know once so oh, we nice. I, I learned from my father's diet but in, in those days we didn't have the drug testing so you'd be taking you could be taking diuretics the, the pills to make you pee you could be taking um tablets to make you go to the toilet all the time but you realize that those are bad for you so mm. you you're saunering and you and you were using a lot of energy um so you were keeping the you, you, your weight down, and you were you know not eating very much. Um, again, that the understanding of diet seems to have improved massively since my day. My son Thomas goes to I think it's, he goes deliberately does not think I know he goes to Liverpool University and they do tests on you on the subtype of food that um, suits you. And since I've given up, I've come to understand that diet better than ever when I was riding and mm. uh, you know I put a bit of weight on when I gave up and now I've lost quite a lot of weight because I I understand that you know I did combination eating I didn't mix my carbohydrates and um, proteins etc when I was riding um, but I think that they used to call it a hay diet I don't think it was, there was anything in it itself but it it was a discipline that you know you don't eat um, between meals, you know, yeah. so you know, by the time you've ridden out, you miss breakfast, you miss lunch because you're racist and you have something to eat at night. So, all of it means kick, kicking out meals and not eating in between. Mm. So, did you eat pasta? I assume not really because it's quite heavy. Um, no, I mean, it was 
protein and vegetable that I eat, fish and and, 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 a, and a green vegetable was, was the best thing at night. And then I find that didn't put too much weight on. Um, if you were around, ten, you know, if you had to ride at 10 stone um, next day, if you were leaving the races around 9.13 and you didn't eat too much, you, I just think you naturally lose three or four pound overnight mm. sleeping. Anyway, but the um, drinking tea and coffee, it's liquid that, you know, you have a cup of coffee that, puts on three quarters of a pound so uh, uh, you've got to be careful with the liquids as much as the food. Yeah because I was saying to Mick Fitzgerald how much I drink in water and then he was explaining to me how you know you'd go for a sweat and then you'd sweat all that water weight out so I suppose that made a huge difference. Yeah I mean I never sweated to, to, to a huge amount I always found that two pound was probably enough because once you start losing a percentage of your body weight in liquids, you, your performance level drops. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I see people go in there, sit, lose five, six, seven, eight, nine pound. I, I was unable to do that. It just didn't suit me. Um, but uh, it, it, you know, some of those flat race jockeys, I think it was George Baker, ate every other day and um, oh, wow. and and. and you know, sat in the saunas. I mean, I remember a poor man has passed away now, one of the great jockeys, Greville Starkey. I remember sat in the sauna with him one day at Sandown and he sat there, he's got a plastic trousers on, he sat in the highest part of the sauna, which is the hottest. He's got a bucket of ice between his legs and he sits there between his, and, and, and as long as he can. And then when he can't bear it anymore, he stuck his head in the bucket of ice and up he came again. I mean, that, you know, the, the, Flat race jockeys go to extremes to to diet that that, that, that we didn't have to jump in. You know, they're flipping, uh, eating every other day, as I said. Um, in, in America, they sat in some of those saunas, hot rooms with them. They rubbed alcohol into themselves to make them sweat more. Really? You know, alcohol, you know. I mean, it, you go back, and it it's always been the same. Was it? Um, Red Archie shot himself because of it, you know, because of the depression of dieting, mm. you know. So uh, Lester Piggott was massively famous for his strict routine in, in, in dieting. Mm. I find it incredible how the human body adapts to, you know, what, what you're doing, if it's a diet or... Yeah, exactly. I mean, whether it's... You know, I've had you know, Neil Jenkins, one of the great rugby players, came up to me and said, you know, he's a pal of mine, and he said... Uh, jockeys aren't sportsmen which he had a point you know but then you see the extremes that jockeys go through to uh, get their weight down um, there is a you know where rugby players are eating as much in, in the gym as uh, to put muscle on and put weight on um, it's you know that's hard enough in itself and it's uh, you know it's, it's equally as hard mm. keeping your body weight uh, below a, a natural you know three or four pound you know, a stone below you what, what's natural to you yeah did you have to be careful about putting muscle weight on and there was never a problem with it you know again in, in the years that went by you heard uh, you know you shouldn't run because that puts muscle on and but i I think we were eating so little and uh, uh, we were driving our body weight down so much that we weren't putting muscle mm. on that really. You know? I mean, we were just skin, bone and muscle, you know. Mm. So, I, you know, I, just silly things I've done. I remember doing some TV program with one of the jockeys, Gladiators. And we had to climb a wall, you know, and, uh, you know, I don't know, one of those great big Gladiators was chasing Carlo and the jockey up the wall well Carl was taking 10 stone this man was taking 13 stone up the wall well mm. Carl's muscle mass to his weight was extraordinary so he shot up the wall the big heavy muscle man couldn't get near him you know yeah. because um, compared to the amount of uh, his body weight he was very strong yeah I remember doing a thing with um, one of the, I think it was oh, his name, my brain is so bad now, um, a world champion uh, boxer. Um, and he was way, way above the weight he fought at. Um, mm. But they dropped that weight um, off very quickly in training. And then they all 
you know, and they're weighing, they'll put a lot of weight back on mm. before. The other people that, you know, all these things, you know, I don't think it was the cross-referencing um, that we understood other sports quite as much in the day I was riding. The cyclists, I mean, they're, they're extraordinary, they, you know, because one pound extra that they have to take up some cycling hill means yeah. half a mile or something, you know. So uh, I've come to understand all those things better since mm. uh, since I gave up. It's, it's a big thing in sports, isn't it? You know, the weight and... Oh, yeah, you know, and I, you know, when I was a kid, footballers had steak and chips before they went out and played. Now they're, you know, their diet, you know, the European diet and stuff mm. is... It's very, very special, yeah. Mm. Um, I just wanted to go back to when you said about flat racers um, having, uh, you know, their career lasted longer. So you, you retired at 34, didn't you? Yeah. So is there a certain age that a jump jockey has to retire or is it a personal choice? It's a personal choice, but um, as you get older, you don't bounce as well. Um, in my day, I think it was 16 Every hundred rides, you could expect sixteen falls. Well, I was riding six or seven hundred horses a season, wow. um, so you're getting a lot of falls. And what, you know, when you set off in the game, um, a fun—it's it's part of the fun falling. And you, mm. you know, um, when you go back in the waiting room and laugh about it, but once you just kick the shoulder a few times and then you can't fall on that shoulder and then that wrist goes and you can't fall on that side you kind of uh, every time you hit the ground you get sore um you know the safety measures that you know they're still hitting the floor they're still mm. they're riding more horses than we did but the safety measures are better and um that we you know the, the, so then you know richard johnson is nearly 40 or he could well be 40 could be plus 40 so he's pushed his career longer john franklin who i know you've spoken to is a magnificent um example to us all as as jockeys and he always said you know we weren't making the money that the flat race jockeys were and he said look go make a few quid get out in one piece and so he sets an example to us to it he gave up 34 i could get pension when i was 35 i knew i had to get on and get another job mm. the longer you leave it the less likely you're going to um, find a way of making a living when you pack up. Uh, you know, we weren't earning enough money like some sportsmen that you didn't have to work when you packed up. So um, I wanted to pack up, and you know, I had a job in the media. Um, I had some businesses behind me, and and I wanted to concentrate on those. Mm, so how did you find the transition from being a jockey then to getting into the media suddenly? Um, I found the media. You know, the jockey thing is a very I suppose any sportsman, and it must be, you know, I mean, jockeys can walk into any shop and not be known, but you, know, you still would go into a room where there's people who know you are and are all over you, and, you know, you walk in as Peter Scudamore, the jockey, you pack up, and suddenly you're Peter Scudamore, Peter Scudamore, and you're taking on um, established media people uh, who write well and speak well on television as Peter Scudamore, not as an ex-champion, you know, okay, the ex-champion jockey's got you into that position, but um, I didn't enjoy the media work. I, 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 I don't mind the newspaper side. I didn't mind the um, radio side. I didn't enjoy the egos of the television side, and I used to find it uh, quite flat. Mm. Um, when you're performing as a trainer or a jockey, you um, have a high or a low lows are very bad but you know it gets it wins or you're an idiot it gets beat when um, uh, the media I used to just find it was just a flat line and um, you know I just it just never clicked for me you know? mm. and I suppose because you you run on adrenaline don't you as you, when you're racing yeah, that's right. there was no adrenaline with um, uh, the media side and I was helping train you know I was in the business that so we were training horses and uh, I was getting a huge adrenaline kick from that, you know, mm. so it's, I did, I wasn't very good at the media and uh, I was, uh, you know, it was another reason I wasn't enjoying it. How soon after you retired did you become a trainer? Well, I'd set up these businesses, I, well, you know, one of the reasons I could retire when I did is that I uh, was given offers to work on television, given an offer to work for a newspaper and I'd brought into a, a, a friend of mine, Nigel Tristan Davis and I had bought a farm together 
and we set up the training side. So it was an immediate transition. You know, right. I was never stuck without anything to do. Mm. Did you still feel like you had more to learn becoming a trainer, or did you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When you come, must be like being a football manager. You come from playing to put them, to, to telling them what to do, and you suddenly realise how little you do know. Yeah. So then, I suppose it was kind of. The same, but a whole new world, essentially, looking at it from a different view. Oh, t- 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 typically, um, you know, a, you know the generalisation is a jockey ride a horse and it wins and you take all the plaudits, gets beat and it's the trainer's fault, um, you know, so you just walk into the dwelling room and shut the door, whereas the mm. trainer, he trains the horse, he performs, everybody says the jockey is wonderful on it, on it, he gets beat and the trainer's an idiot, you know, so there's, and you have to go home with a uh, with, with the problems of the horse, with a jockey, you don't. Mm. What would you say is the most memorable moment in your career? Oh, I, looked at, I was very lucky. I wanted to be champion jockey and I was champion jockey. I, I read 221 winners in the season, mm. which before AP came along was you know unheard of. I mean, when I was um, first riding, 100 winners was easily going to get you champion. So to double that plus more, mm-hmm. Chateau John's record 149 was pretty special, you know, as a scar in its history, you know, people um, didn't know that's, that's what I did at the time. So was that all over the media when you um, beat John Joe and Neil? Was that kind of a big blow up in the media? Yeah, I suppose, in the, you know, it's obviously you live in your own little bubble, you think, you read, it, you open the press up to paper, read about yourself. Um, think everybody else is reading it, I think everybody else is watching it, but in reality they're not. Yeah. I wonder what that would be like. I said to um, Mick Fitzgerald, you know, when he won the Grand National, with all the cameras and everything, I suppose it's quite surreal because you haven't kind of taken it in just yet and people want interviews and stuff like that. Yes, um, yes, it's, it's, it's surreal, it's like false, I always think, you know, I don't know, it's, it's a human nature to want to public wants to adore something, wants to, um, and you think, well, you haven't seen the bollock and the wife gave you this morning, or the bank manager's not very happy with you, or you've upset your mother, you know, this this, this is really when the television camera stops rolling you back to the normality of life, and I think, you know, I watch, you know, I watch some of the bits of it, I think some people get carried away with a cat TV camera in front of them that they they, they see something in themselves that's not there and, mm. uh, uh, but but that's so what that's just a personal opinion you know I just think mm. always try to be keep my feet in the ground and stay real I didn't always but mm. I tried to you know if you if you make it it becomes people will treat you differently mm. it, it, you know it's just you know I, you don't have an old man telling you it just is it's, it, it's just uh, it, it, I don't know. It's there must be a myth about it, you know. I don't know about a legend about you know when when you get over adulation, you you can believe the adulation in yourself. You've mm. got to hit the reality, but it's very difficult to do because you know that's why I speak to John. I'm as great admirer of John and everything that he Frank and the way he handled everything. Mm. He was true to himself on television, and he was true to himself. And it, it was when he was off television, very few people can do that. Yeah. Oh, look, he he's one. Of, He's probably the greatest racing character in, in, in national hunt racing mm. in, in, in my time, you know. The Tory and Piggott have been outstanding uh, characters on the flat. But John, and of course AP is, what AP has done is nobody can compare with, but you know, John is a very sound human being. Mm. I have a bonus question from my mum, so every time I just yeah. get her to do a yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. So she wants to know about the weighting horses. Do they weigh them before and after the race? Um, obviously, the weight, the weighing of the horses of the last 30, 40 years, probably Martin Pike, was amongst those that um, had the weighing of the horse. Um, yes, we weigh them. You, you know, if you get... There is a racing weight. There is a weight in which the... the New will produce new best performance. So this pipe, you might pipe to describe it as a, a jigsaw puzzle. If you have its weight, its correct blood, its correct health, the correct ground, its correct gallops, yeah. then you have a more of a chance of it producing its best. Um, so you weigh it before the races, and it gives you some idea. And you weigh it after the races, and you 
you will see whether it, what to what level it's performed to. Uh, mm. Sometimes horses, Martin said, you know, they send to the races and uh, they uh, would lose and not run because the racing's off or something. They would lose a lot of weight just through the travelling to the races and other horses would run, go to the races, run and come, run poorly and come back, not lose, lose any weight, means they probably haven't tried very hard, you know. Oh, really? So, yes, I was say, so what causes them to lose that weight so quickly? Probably liquid, you know, worrying yeah. about liquid in the, you know, and, and therefore they're sweating in the box, you know. Yeah, so I suppose when they've gone round, they've sweated so yeah. much and then that's the, the gap. Yeah, yeah, and if one hasn't tried, they're, they're, they're not sweating, are they? Mm. Trying to get my dog to sit down. <laughs> sit down! <laughs> sit! Oh, I miss my dog, I don't have my dog here. Um, well, <laughs> that is all my questions. <laughs> Good. Thank but, you very much indeed. I hope it was it goes okay. Oh, for you. brilliant! I, yeah. I wish you the very best in your uh, career, and I hope you're interviewing myself and my partner <laughs> Cinder after some big race win. Yeah, honestly, that would be absolutely incredible. Like that is my vision, and I know I'm going to get there. I know I'm going to do it. <laughs> I just have best that focus. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been fabulous. Nice to do it. Thank you. Okay, bye. and you. Bye.